Well, if you would turn to Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, you heard it read earlier. This uh, may sound familiar to some of you ladies. I gave a message on this text at the ladies' breakfast on short notice. I revised that some um, in light of Thomas not being here this morning, and we'll look at this text. Uh, hopefully, the Lord will bless it to our hearts for our encouragement, edification, even conviction of sin. Let's pray. Our Father, we call upon you now in the hour of our inquiring of the Word of God. It is your holy word. It is Christ speaking to us. We trust that it might reach our hearts for your glory and for our good. We pray in his name, the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. John Greenleaf Whittier said, For all of all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. And far too often, Christians complain that they aren't sure what their purpose is in life. It may be accompanied with a sense of discontentment. And those two things often go together. Perhaps boredom or apathy underlies the symptoms. And unfortunately, many Christians reach their golden years with the regret it might have been. And the issue impacts every believer, no matter what station of life. Perhaps you may be wondering if there's any meaningful place for you in the kingdom of God. There are some single men or single women who are perfectly content in their singleness and readily find a place to fit in the kingdom of God, but there are some who struggle with contentment and a sense of purpose. Some husbands and wives may sometimes find it difficult to find a niche in life, both as individuals or as married couples. Mothers may be wrestling with the all-consuming responsibilities of rearing children, wondering if they're missing some larger purpose in life. Fathers are consumed not only with the demands of work, finding purpose and contentment outside that sphere sometimes eludes them. Widowed and divorced men and women find themselves in a life that no one ever prepares for. Getting your moorings and finding direction does not always come easy. There are several places we could go to address this subject of purpose and contentment, but let's look for a few minutes at Ecclesiastes 9, verses 1 to, uh, through 10. You heard the text read to you earlier. At first glance, that may appear to be an odd place to look, but the preacher of Ecclesiastes has been addressing a search for meaning in his life throughout the book. And so much does not make sense. Experimentation with many of the common things of this world left him empty. And the key to the book of Ecclesiastes is to consider life from two perspectives. We all live under the sun, a phrase that's often repeated in the book. Some approach life under the sun as a life without God, without faith, without hope, without purpose, unhappy. They just say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The other perspective is the life of a believer. They realize that Similar unhappy events happen to both believers and unbelievers, but they can get a grip because they have a worldview that is formed by faith in God and in the scriptures, which gives them direction for life. They find joy in life even in the midst of trouble because they're looking at life through a completely different lens. They see life through the eye of faith rather than futility. And so the context of this section of scripture is life and death. The time of opportunity is while we are alive. Once we pass on, all opportunities are passed. Hence the title, Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. And the theme of the text is found in verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And so let us look at several directives that will help us with the struggle of purpose and contentment direction in this life. And the first thing we notice is all are under the control of God's sovereignty. Verses 1 and 2. First verse 1, but all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. Here's the mystery of providence. God is sovereign over the righteous 
and over the wicked. He controls all circumstances of life. He's not a bystander letting things happen without his involvement. He hasn't turned the world completely over to Satan. He runs the show. And note in verse 1, it's from his prior, the preacher's prior reflections. He says, but all of this, that refers to what's gone on before. Man cannot know God's ways. In Ecclesiastes 8, 14, he said, there is a vanity that takes place on earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. It's perplexing when you look at the world and realize that crazy things happen, and it happens to all alike, good things, bad things. And life is fleeting, and no one, no matter how wise, can seem to make sense of it all. He, he comes to the conclusion that no one is the master of his own fate. Something else is going on beyond me. And the world outside of faith does not understand that God is in control of all things. And even believers find themselves with this cynical view of life sometimes. What is God doing? Where is he leading me? It's tempting to become cynical at the point that point of life. Ecclesiastes 7, 15, in my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. The problem is God deals out some pretty confusing stuff sometimes. And no one knows exactly how God is going to dish out the matters of life. It says in our text, whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. The NIV says, but no one knows whether love or hate awaits him. It can be interpreted either as the love of God, the love of hate, or love or hate from God towards an individual, or more likely, the love or hate others have for you in life. You're not in control of how good or evil may come your way, how people may love you or not love you. You might experience prosperity or you might be as poor as a church mouse, but believers are no more immune to the adversities of life than the unbeliever. There's an old, old song that begins with these words. What is, what is it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? That sentiment res resonates with many who believe they have lost their way. Believers and unbelievers are under the same providences of God. Verse 2, it is the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. But the righteous and the wicked, the good one, the sinner, the clean, the unclean, the Jew, the Gentile, those who offer religious sacrifices, those who do not, believers and unbelievers, all alike are under the sovereign control of Almighty God. And so you may ask the question, does what I do really matter? But you notice in verse 1, it says of the righteous, their deeds are in the hand of God. The works or deeds you do are in the special care and supervision of God. He's the orchestrating God who orchestrates all things just the way that pleases him. And it's important to realize God knows your exact state in life. His eye is on you and you are under his sovereign care and control. Your life is not meaningless. It has purpose. And this is the realization that must turn the lights on for every believer. In the midst of their great doubt, the righteous, it says, the wise and their deeds, their works are in the hand of God. Not only are the saints in the hand of God, which no one can pluck them out, but our very deeds, our very works, our efforts are under his special care. Charles Spurgeon preached to thousands in his lifetime. His penny sermons reached even countless thousands more beyond those who sat under his preaching. 
John MacArthur claimed that during the live streaming of the first few weeks of COVID, where he preached gospel messages, he had some like, something like 60,000 viewers hearing the gospel. But tell me, is their work worth any more to God than a few gospel tracts that you've passed out in your lifetime? Or a handful of co-workers you've witnessed to your entire lifetime? Does your faithful care of your household and your children really count? Is your Christian testimony before neighbors, schoolmates, co-workers without infinite value? When you come alongside someone to encourage them in the faith or disciple them, God is right there, is he not? Is teaching your children not a great work under God's special care or a nursery worker, a Sunday school teacher, your prayers, a meal delivered to a family in need, writing cards, letters, emails, texts, and so forth? You notice in the text it doesn't say great works are in his hand. It says their deeds, the deeds of the righteous are in the hand of, the God, of God. The works of the righteous and the wise, whoever they are, the widow's two mites was counted as more than all the others had put in the offering. She had given out of her poverty, they out of their abundance. The woman who anointed Jesus' head with her expensive perfume, Jesus said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. She has done what she could. What she has done will be told in memory of her. Like the widow, she did what she could. She gave all she had. And this should motivate us to get busy and seize the day. The non-believer must be awakened also to the reality that in this special way, their works are not in the hand of God. Believers will be rewarded for their works, but if you're an unbeliever on Judgment Day, you will be condemned by your works. It's not that God is not sovereign and very aware of all of your deeds. He's so aware of them that on Judgment Day, you will give an account for your deeds. Besides noticing that all are under the control of God's sovereignty, we see another common denominator between believers and unbelievers. Second of all, all share a common destiny of death. Verse 3, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after they go to the dead, after that they go to the dead. Here the preacher is using event, seems like synonymous with death, Verse 5, it says, For the living know that they will die. Death is no respecter of persons. Death is a great leveler. Death comes to all alike. And it is this inevitable event of death that the preacher uses to drive home his point. We know that Ecclesiastes 9.3 is just a further exposition of the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. It echoes the Garden of Eden and the results of Adam's fall into sin. Adam sins, and in him death comes upon all the children of men, the Adam in the Hebrew. They are dead spiritually at birth and will one day die physically. And between being born in sin and dying in our uh, uh, fallen sinful state, man continuously sins. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it is now. Our hearts are full of evil or madness, as the text says. And this is the reason we die in the first place, for the wages of sin is death. And the unbeliever cannot handle this reality, so in their fallen depravity, they go wild. You notice it says they're full of evil. Madness is in their hearts. The life of the sinner is characterized by madness. Ecclesiastes 10, 13, the words of his mouth begin with foolishness and the end of his talk is raving madness. Sin is madness. It is a lifelong prob problem of the heart. All the years that they live, it is pervasive. The children of men are full of evil, the text says. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
And so the unbeliever looks at the reality of death. And what is their response? If death is all I have to look forward to, I have no hope in this life. I'm going to live it up, drugs and drunkenness and illicit sexual affairs and so on and so forth. Fallen hearts devise ways of madness and folly to live out their days on this earth. And this is not just about an outward behavior, but the inward heart is corrupt. It's desperately wicked. It's full of evil. It's full of madness. And this same destiny of death befalls all alike. But because the unrighteous make no sense in life and the grim reaper is inevitable to all alike, this causes those outside of God's covenant, those who are not believers, to live out their fallen depravity to the hilt. And because they have no hope in their death, they live a life of madness and folly full of evil and all sorts of debauchery. Every act of rebellion is against God, and it is madness. It may not be so outwardly expressed, but if you're without Christ today, in your heart is raging madness. Life is from God, yet it is despised by you. This is madness. The gospel is heard and rejected. This is madness. The goodness of God is enjoyed by sinners while the God of goodness is hated. This is madness. The self-destructing madness is irrational. It's delusional. It's irrational to live in God's world and rebel against him. It's irrational to hear the overtures of Christ and reject him. It is a mere delusion to think there is hope in this life to come in the life to come when you abandon all means of hope in this life. But one day the madness of this life comes to an end if you're an unbeliever. Death is the end of madness among the living. This madness ends at the grave only to enter the land of eternal madness. And that is hell. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us we all have an appointment with death and judgment certainly follows after that. And so the day you need to see above all other days is the day of salvation. And that day is today. If you hear his voice, follow him. But the believer looks at death differently. The preacher is speaking to us. The reality of death should motivate us to find purpose and meaning and contentment in this life. We're not to live as though we are wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. We are to seize the day. And so that brings us to a third prod by the preacher. What remedy is there for the believer against this madness that leads to a hopeful or a hopeless eternity? Third of all, where there is life, there is hope, verses 4 through 6. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. In this life, things are decided for all eternity. That's what the text is saying. And death is a sobering reminder that we must do all that we can in this life, this side of death. It must be settled this side of eternity. The believer lives in hope while enjoying the <clears throat> watchful care of God. But there's a warning to the unbelievers. Death is the point of no return. It's only while we're here in this life that there's hope. And unbelievers need to take notice. It's the grace of God that comes through the gospel. It's the redeeming grace of God. The fa faithlessness is unbelief, and unbelief is, as we said, madness. <coughs> and this unbelief meets with severe consequences. The answer must be sought in this life. God's people need to think about this. There is a living hope now because of the grace of God. And the preacher's telling us that all opportunities to live in hope are lost after death for us as well. If this hope is not gained in this world, it's lost forever. 
that is the hope of doing something, accomplishing something, achieving things for the kingdom of God's sake. No one comes back from the grave to make up for lost time. In this life, in the land of the living, there is hope to lay hold of God. When you die outside the covenant mercies of God, you have abandoned all hope. And for most of us believers, the memory of you will likely be no more than a marker over your grave. But as long as there is breath and life, there is hope to make some difference. The preacher here is not denying the afterlife or saying that after death you just go to sleep and are forever unconscious. He's telling us that death is a closed door for opportunity. The living have a chance to carry on with so many possibilities. After death, those possibilities will never again come your way. And he contrasts life and death with extremes of a living dog and a dead lion. The dog was the most despised animal in ancient Israel. They were not adored as cute little cuddly creatures. Sorry, dog lovers, but they were considered worthless scavengers. On the other hand, the lion was considered mightiest among all the beasts, Proverbs 30, 30. And it was most admired for you cat lovers. Life is filled with so many possibilities. Once we are gone, those possibilities evaporate into thin air. And what a shame. What a greater motivation than death itself to prod us on to realizing we need to carpe diem, seize the day. And in light of that, he tells us, fourth of all, what is lawful should be readily enjoyed. Verses 7 through 9, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with a wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life, in your toil at which you toil under the sun. A string of imperatives beginning with go and eat and drink and enjoy. The Christian living in the land of a sovereign God is facing inevitable death one day. is mandated by God to live a happy, joyful life. And one may enjoy the mercies of God in contrast to living in madness and having no hope when you die. We're saved by grace and begotten to a living hope. And this is not just seizing the day and doing, but it's seizing the day with a state of joy by the things that God has offered to us. Note the things that he reminds us of. Contentment, verse 7. Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. These are the good gifts of God. As one has said, it's a summons to be up and doing and is directed against the tendency to brood and to ponder over the vexations, the vexatious problems of life. God has given us gifts to enjoy, and they're part of his care for us. Jesus, think about it, lived a life of hardship and harassment and so much grief, and yet he enjoyed life's lawful pleasures. He was found enjoying a wedding feast, even providing the best wine. He attended lively dinners amongst his good friends and even sinners. His eating and drinking with friends even brought false accusation that he was a drunkard and a glutton and eating with rabble-rousers. But as untrue as these accusations were, there's no doubt Jesus found a time to be merry at heart. But not only contentment, celebration, verses 8 and 9. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. These are terms that speak of victory, of triumph. White is not so much of purity here, but a garment of victory. Oil was a sign of joy, of celebration, often after a victory in battle. We have every reason to celebrate nothing in the mystery of God's providence should steal our joy, tempting as that may be. And so the believer in every age before the cross and after the cross has triumphed as the very foundation of life. 
And God has also given close relationships, one of those being marriage. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love, and so forth, verse 9. This life is fleeting. That's what the word vain means in this context. Vapor, it's like a vapor, James says. says. It goes quickly. And so while you're living, trust God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. It's your portion. Uh, that word portion was very meaningful to a Jewish person. It meant their land. They were given a piece of land, and it meant their life, their livelihood. But they applied it also to the Lord. Lamentations 3.24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And so God has entrusted to us everything to enjoy as long as we use them lawfully. And the believer knows that death is somewhere in the future, so they are exhorted lawfully to enjoy life as long as God is willing to lend it to them. The unbeliever tends to fill their life with distractions to ward off fear of the inevitable, but the things God allows for our enjoyment become sinful indulgences. They're good for us, they're bad for them because they do not know how to embrace life as a believer. And so love and enjoyment Enjoy your wife, and if you, if you have one, but there are other relationships, as we're learning in Sunday school as well, that can be cultivated this side of the grave. And then there's confidence, verse 7. For God has already approved what you do. Now, some see this word approved as an Old Testament way of saying justification before God. If it is that, as we are accepted in the beloved, but it, it has to go beyond that. It's, it says the believer's works are approved. He's already approved of what you're doing. We've already learned that our works are under God's special sovereign care. And so our works do not give us approval for righteousness sake, but the works of the righteous are approved by God. And that's a motivator. This is the basis of not only our contentment, but it gives us great confidence. God has already, in other words, a long time ago, up to this present point, put his stamp of approval, his smile, his pleasure on the good things we do with the gifts he has granted to us. And those seemingly insignificant things you have done for others have received the approval of the Almighty God. And this approval also hints to our life in Christ. If we are right with God, approved of God, accepted in the beloved through faith, we should give our all to living life to its fullest potential. And that will drive us to find contentment and purpose in life. We're living in his hand as accepted and we are given as a summons to live a joyful life. But flowing from the knowledge that God's favor is upon us and all that we do brings about the punchline to the narrative, and that's in verse 10. And this is fifth of all, the practical exhortation to commitment. Carpe diem, seize the day. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. The margin says, or whatever your hand finds to do with your, uh, do your, with your might, do it. Do it with your might, with all your might. There's no apathetic mindset, no defeatist attitude, no gloom and doom, or rather carpe diem, seize the day. We're to put our hand to the plow and not look back. The word finds means opportunity. It speaks to opportunity. The word hand refers to the strength or ability God has given to you. As one said, to do whatever your hand finds to do, therefore, is to give oneself to life with its joys and its responsibilities according to one's abilities and circumstances. That means there are limitations to what you might do compared to what you might do or they might do. And the word might is whatever your hand finds to do, it means whatever you're able to do, whatever your gift to do, to do, whatever your capacity by God has been given to you to do, do that 
little or great, small or big, whatever it might be, with all of your might, give it all your energy, all your time, all of your heart, your all. And why is that? We're always reminded of this because when death comes, all opportunities for work, service to others, ministry of any kind will have passed. After death, one has paraphrased, there will be neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. Uh, this very familiar idea is presented by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time. The King James Version, redeeming the time making the best use of time because the days are evil. The New Living Translation says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And then verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Work willingly, heartily. Again, someone says what one's hand finds refers to what is available within one's ability. Life is to be active, energetic, practical. Death is the end of opportunity. And Jesus knew that when he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. But he joyfully sets himself to the task at hand. The hour he came to his greatest work on the cross. He labored up until that point of his agonizing death. This great work provided the means for his people to enjoy living in the hand of God with hope and happiness here and in the world beyond. But what's the practical contemporary application to this? Someone well said, men are called to the glory of the vocation of being men and women to the high calling of being women. God has called you as a male or female. He's called you in a station of life. Whatever that place is that you are, we are exhorted to seize the day and to do it with all of our might. Singles have a unique special calling as long as the Lord allows. You have more time to devote to spiritual things, Paul said. You can find purpose in serving the body, hospitality, discipleship, serving. Wives without children find purpose, meaning, and contentment in serving your husbands. Find other opportunities to serve in whatever way you can. Husbands without children, be the best husband you're able to be. Be the captain of your home. Love your wives. Fathers, lead your families, even if it's reading a verse or two and praying a feeble prayer. Find a place to serve in the kingdom of God. Mothers, you have, as an old pastor uh, once said, Pastor Walt Chantry long, long ago preached a sermon, the high calling of motherhood. Give it all, give it your all. Seize the day while the day is here. Widows are divorced Folks, climbing out of, out of grief to a place of contentment and purpose is not easy. That's why we need community. It's the place of healing and getting back your sense of direction. But there's a place for you to seize the day as well. Elizabeth Elliot Well said, some of God's greatest mercies are in his refusals. He says no in order that he may in some way we cannot imagine say yes. But there's so much you have to offer, especially if you're older. Some believe the widow's list was made up of older women who were qualified to fit the role of Titus II and taking the younger women under their wing and teaching them the practical issues of life. For men or women, single or married, widowed or divorced, whatever your station in life, we have all gone through trials of certain degrees and we all have a ministry of comfort a word of encouragement to others who have suffered in this life, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Seize the day. Use your trial. Use your, your uh, time of testing for a purpose of encouraging someone else in the way that God encouraged you or comforted you when you were in your affliction. Well, finally, and last of all, as we close, examples in the Bible and church history who made the difference by seizing the day, putting their hand to the plow and doing it with all of their might. And we could search the Bible and march through church history and name single men and women, married men, women, fathers, mothers, widows, widowers, divorced men and women, some middle age, some younger, some older, Boys, girls who have made a tremendous impact for the sake of the gospel on the lives of individuals to entire, uh, sometimes just to individuals, to the entire uh, portion or a region of the world. Sometimes they were high profile people, sometimes they were uh, uh, not so high profile, young, old, and in between. Sometimes they were unknowns to most people. And they were all in different stations of life. And you can scour the Bible, you can look through church history and find numerous accounts of ordinary people who seized the day. David was a youth when he took on Goliath for the cause of the kingdom. He seized the day. Daniel was about 17, and his three friends were perhaps even younger. They seized the day. Joseph seized the day as a young man. Moses' best years were the last 40 of his life. Life came to him uh, 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 in, after he uh, was 40 or so and, be, uh, and began, really, to take off when he was 80. Of course, he died at 120. That helps. But he seized the day. <laughs> Joshua, who succeeded him likewise, was among the elderly and led God's people to go and conquer the land. He seized the day. Caleb, too, one of those elderly men that God used to spy out the land. Rahab, a prostitute, seized the day when by faith did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Her act of faith allowed Joshua and Caleb to escape, and they in turn did mighty things for God. How did she know that one act would open doors for the kingdom of God? And then Jesus, of course, was searching for a way to feed 5,000 people. You may have forgotten this story, but disciple Andrew found a young boy. They didn't know where they were going to get lunch, and there was a young boy who brought his lunch, a meal of uh, five loaves and two small fishes. And that young boy turned over his lunch to Jesus and the rest is history. <laughs> Generally, it's the older generation who suffer the greatest loss of purpose or usefulness in the kingdom. But remember Anna, the prophetess, a widow of great age, about 84 years of old, of age, in the temple, she prayed. Isaiah and Daniel actively served the Lord well into their 80s and 90s. Esther stood in the gap at a critical time in preserving the Jews. She was born for a time like that, and she seized the day. Fanny Crosby, 43 years old, when she found her talent, wrote over 8,000, maybe 9,000 hymns. No one even knows because she put pseudonyms on so many of them. Frances Schaeffer, who influenced an entire generation or two with his writings and his teachings, was little known until he was in his 50s. Mary Slessor became a missionary to Nigeria at the age of 28. We could go on and on. Jesus was 30 years old when he entered his ministry. He was cut off by the age of 33, but he seized the day. He was bent from the cradle to the cross to do the work of his father. He knew his purpose. It was divinely ordained, and his life was driven by the necessity of the cause. He put his hand to the work, and he did it with all of his might. And no one will ever copy that finished work of redemption, but we are to fix our eyes upon Jesus, that very founder and perfecter of our faith. And so I would say to you this morning, carpe diem, seize 
the day. And verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And as we read earlier in the service, Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17, let your, works be, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the works of our hands upon us. Yes, we need to pray this way, the psalmist says. Yes, establish the works of our hands. And I trust as you seize the day, as you put your hand to the plow, as you endeavor to do whatever you do, whether it be small or great, that these words will ring in your eternal, eternal ears. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the jo joy of your master. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Our Father, we are delighted at your word and how it prods us in so many ways. We thank you most of all that you give all of us something some way, some gift, some strength, some ability to do something in the kingdom of God. And I trust as we look at our lives as a vapor, swiftly moving, that we would take the preacher's words to heart, that we would seize the day, and that we would do whatever we do Find it and do it with all of our might. Oh, for that we need the grace of God, the help of God. To help us through the power of the Spirit to be all that we can for your glory and for your kingdom's sake.